Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Uh, Sister Renee is here with me, Brother Ben, and we're eager to get going. So let's say hello to the congregation and let's start off with the untwisted sister, Renee. Hello, everybody. I am Brother oh, Luke. Oh, sorry. I got Welcome you on the background Sunday here. I got to mute it. Here we go. You were saying it twice. See? Uh, hey, you guys, I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm looking forward to the fellowship. Uh, good to see so many in the chat. And, uh, you know, I always look forward to this. I might be tired now, but I'm usually revived by the time we're done. Yeah, I've noticed that, too, that a lot of times uh, either I'm tired or not feeling up to it for some reason. But once we get started, uh, it's just wonderful, wonderful blessing to every time without fail well one one time there was one thing where the program was a failure remember that friday night program where i decided we were going to have to quit friday nights for <laughs> for a week oh, but yeah. other than that, everyone's been wonderful so uh, i'm looking forward to that happening today brother ben will you say hi to the congregation yes hello everyone good to see you and i was actually making that case last night um where I, uh, you know, it's easy to chase after like, oh, what's going to make me feel good? Um, I, I, I'm definitely a victim of that, of chasing in my emotions. Um, like I, I, if I do this thing, uh, I will feel this way. You know, it's like almost like buying feelings from a vending machine or something. Whereas true happiness, true um, enjoyment comes from doing something necessarily that you don't want to do. It can be something simple like cleaning your house or doing whatever you were putting off for a long time, finally getting it done. Uh, and, and this, the relief and the joy that comes from that can, can make a big deal. So it's, yeah, I think it is important that we sometimes do things that make it, that we don't necessarily feel like doing. Um, it could be a, a real blessing. So I, I think that is, uh, I think it's a good advice. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, so let's see who's in the chat room right now. Chris, Annie. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, um, Chris Annie has been uh, uh, sending us artwork. She's uh, a volunteer. She answered uh, the uh, request that I made last week. I think it was just last week. Maybe it was the week before. Um, Chris Annie, and um, I've gotten several uh, letters from her also uh, with uh, artwork that she's already begun to help, to help us with our uh, you know, our icons, our uh, thumbnails, our back, backdrops for the pages, the home pages. And so uh, thank you already for that. It's interesting what she's come up with so far. So I'm sure when we finally get it all done, that it's going to be uh, wonderful. Um, so uh, let me see who else is in there. Oops, I've got too many things open right now. Okay. Uh, Mr. Heather. Yeah, we need uh, we need those uh, moderators in the chat room because we don't have that many problems with trolls the way we had in the past. But every once in a while, someone sneaks in here and tries to uh, stir up trouble. So we we couldn't conduct these programs if we didn't have the the moderators to deal with that. And uh, all right, well, I can, rather than saying hi to everybody, I'll just do it. Hello, safe. Um, Hey, I don't have any announcements to make uh, uh, today. Uh, Renee or Ben, can you think of any announcements that need to be made? Oh, yeah. Uh, I put it on my channel. Uh, Celine had contacted this uh, document documentary filmmaker. He's a, he's a Baptist, so he's got a lot of similar beliefs as we do. But he started a new program called The Uncensored Truth. And I was the second episode he did, uh, and it was done on soteriology. Um, so on the doctrine of salvation and, uh, you know, just a general statement about a little bit of my history in Hollywood, but how I basically came to the faith, why I fight for the gospel and the clarity of it and what's wrong with most churches and, and what they're preaching for salvation. And so his channel is Peter Reddick. It's R E D D O C H, uh, and it's the uncensored truth episode two. Um, 
But if you go on my channel and look, I think it's yesterday, I put the link for it. It premiered live, uh, I believe, Saturday night at 9 p.m. And uh, But he pre-recorded it, but he aired it live so that people could chat. So if you want to see that, go to my channel and uh, click the link and it'll take you to his channel. Uh, seems like he's got some good biblical documentaries there as well as some other channels he's associated with. So um, I did want to support Peter uh, on his efforts in doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, ben, any announcements for you? No, uh, only I'm dropping the link to uh, that program in the chat now. So if you're interested in later, um, it's going to be right there for you. Yes. Uh, I also I want to mention that uh, Jasmine uh, uh, Grace has also sent us some artwork that looks very good too. So uh, as as the art uh, offerings come in, uh, we'll consider it all and try to figure out which one's uh, the best approach for the future look for the church channel. Also, they're doing some work for the, my channel, Brother Luke, and, and Sister Renee's uh, channel, or Renee Rowland, with some artwork, new artwork. So you'll see some new looks on all these channels here very soon. Um, also, okay, any uh, prayer needs to uh, Renee? Yeah, Chris and E, of course, uh, for her brother, you know, who's a veteran, was struggling, and they, they brought him home. We want to keep him and her family in prayer. Um, a lot of the prayers that I asked for last week, some had been answered. Uh, our friend uh, prayed for his grandmother, asked you guys to pray. She has recovered, and she has returned home, so thank you for your prayers. Um, I do want to keep lifting up Sister Lisa with uh, her health and um, – Jennifer Petty with her health and Anthony Suarez with his uh, kidney transplant. You know, you guys, he was in the hospital. I haven't heard back from him. Uh, he was in there with a high fever and low blood pressure, which is very bad for someone with no functioning kidneys. So uh, keep him in prayer, especially right now. Uh, Martha Ferrer in uh, Florida, our sister there. Uh, you guys saw her with me when I visited there. Uh, year before last with my son and uh, Jonathan Hine in the UK. Uh, he has lost so much. He's still got cancer, but he never does anything but say kind words. He is always so sweet, no matter what loss, no matter what he's going through. He's always so kind. So I want to keep him in prayer as well as keeping this ministry in prayer and all who contend for the faith once delivered unto, unto the saints, because there is a lot coming against the gospel message. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, Brother Ben, any prayer needs uh, you want to tell us about? Uh, well, I've been looking through chat, and I didn't see, uh, I didn't see any, but I might have missed some. But I know uh, there's a couple of issues that Renee brought uh, that she said that she uh I, I, I got the sense that she was uh, she needed prayer for um, or would appreciate prayer for. So uh, I would ask that we pray for uh, some things that Renee is dealing with. So. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I can give you a, a praise report. Um, Chris Annie let me know that uh, the, the problem with uh, her, uh, her her brother that last last week, uh, uh, everything went exactly perfectly to you know fix the problem so uh and and she said that it, it had to be the prayers and the lord helping because uh, certain problems were couldn't have been resolved without uh without that uh okay let me see mg uh uh still looking for a job brother luke all right Wonder does it take a long time to get a job now? I imagine it would, since so many people have lost their jobs. The bad time to try to be looking for one. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's uh, if there's no other prayer needs, uh, let's let's take some time now. We'll take thirty seconds and uh, ask that everybody pray for uh, all these needs that were just mentioned. And as Renee said. 
pray for this church too. too. Uh, we, we've um, we've made a lot of progress the last few weeks uh, in, in this transition we've gone through, but uh, I think everything is looking up really good right now. So, all right, let's do that. Let's take 30 seconds and pray now. Okay, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I guess I can also say that uh, on uh, Friday night, uh, if you missed it, uh, go back and watch it. We we had uh, the first appearance of Sister Heather uh, on the, the panel for the Friday night program. She'll be a, a regular panelist on Friday nights. Uh, and we had last week uh, an appearance by Brother Kevin, Church for the Truth. And it just went very well. Uh, and it was real good chemistry with everybody, and uh, everybody had a great time. So, thank you uh, for thank you, Kevin, for for filling in since we had an opening. Try to have uh, six people on that panel normally, and that's a lot to deal with. Usually, three or four people is really the right number, but that's the only time we have more than three or four. It's Fridays. Uh, and I, I will say that the Thursday uh, program that Brother Steve has been doing uh, with uh, uh, Ben and uh, Angel, uh, the content has been fantastic. Uh, they really, and if you've missed those, I hope you'll you'll go and watch those on on Steve's channel. Um, all right, I guess there's nothing else to do. So let's, without any further ado, let's go into the questions. Uh, the first... uh, how about hymns? You want to do hymns? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, please. Yeah. You probably tell my mind is foggy right now. For some reason, I can't think straight, but uh, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, please, Ben, let's do some hymns. I could use that right now. Okay. With, with regards to the hymns, uh, the ones I have today uh, are the ones that we've played many times. I never get tired of them. I don't think a lot of people probably do. They're, they're awesome. But if you have any suggestions for music that you'd like us to play, uh, feel free to uh, make those suggestions and send them to uh, Church of the Eternally Secure at gmail.com. And with that, I'll play the first hymn. Sings my soul, 
my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think of God, His Son, not sparing, can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin shall come with shout of acclamation to take me home. What joy shall fill my heart, and I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim my God, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great, how great, how great. Far and grave. 
Okay, thanks. I have I have several hoops I got to jump through before I can get back because I actually listened to that, but it's delayed. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, we, we never get tired of how great thou art and and uh, amazing grace, but I think we've got about I don't know maybe fifteen songs in our library to choose, Ben. So uh, it, I know you probably. Love the Probably what? closer to 10. Probably closer to 10. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, then. Okay. Everybody ready to get into the uh, discussion? If yes, you're new sir. here uh, and uh, uh, the um, study portion of our program is uh, based on the questions that come in from the congregation. So if you have a question that you'd like to uh, give us to answer, uh, send it to Church of the Eternally Secure at gmail.com. And uh, Ben, how are we doing on questions? Are we uh, getting low or we still have a lot of questions? We probably have like probably enough for another maybe month. Yeah. But yeah, we, uh, we, we're going to need some more. Mm -hmm. So, but don't let that deter you just because we've got a lot of questions on the list right now. Uh, please send them in and we'll add yours to the list. Uh, we don't ever want to run out. What would we do if we ran out of questions? Wow. <laughs> All right, here's the first question for today. Um, part A, I guess there's two parts, part A and B to this question. I have some questions that need to be untwisted about Hebrews 12, 15 through 17, which says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears." First question is about verse 15, which says, any main fail of the grace of God, then lists some sins. Lordshippers take this to mean that we only stay in the grace of God as long as we are not sinning. What is fail the grace of God? And please untwist. You know, when they use this word untwist, it makes me think of a particular person, the untwisted sister. Yeah. <laughs> well, off the top of my head, I, I'd have to say, uh, first of all, this book is to Hebrew people specifically. Um, and there are much warnings in this book about going back to the Levitical temple system and animal sacrifice that, they need to be resting in the one-time sacrifice of Jesus, realizing it's finished and it's done. But the context here, I believe, is temporal, temporal earthly consequences, because if you go up a little further in chapter 12, it talks about the chastening or the correction of the Lord. And it says, furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? See, temporal, earthly consequence. But verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So he's saying God will correct us if we get off the right path. We're not walking. This is about walking in it, right? Uh, and if you go right above chapter 15 to 14 and 13, it says, and make straight paths for your feet. These are, these are Old Testament references here. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Remember in the Corinthian church, some of them had died and had gotten sick because they were unworthily partaking of the Lord's Supper, getting drunk and uh, being gluttonous and forsaking the poor, right? So it says, so this is about heal, their physical healing, their spiritual healing, and the healing of the church, okay? 
So it says, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let, her, let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, for at, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, the holiness we have uh, imputed on us is the holiness. It's a gift. God made us holy through the offering of Jesus' body. And in Hebrews itself, it tells us that we were sanctified by the offering of Jesus's body. So that's permanent holiness. God set us apart and made us holy, right? But this here is talking about other men, okay? So other men will not see the Lord if we don't live peacefully and holy, all right? Follow peace with all men and holiness, for without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest, notice what it said, fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Uh, so it's about defiling the church with unapproved behavior of the saints. All right. And it's about correction, chastening, being healed or not, uh, and living peaceably and holy with others because no man will see the Lord. They won't see the Lord in us. They won't see the Lord within the church. Um, but as far as the holiness for us to see the Lord, it's not talking about us seeing the Lord in heaven. It's talking about seeing the Lord here in the church, in others. That's why it says be peaceable with all men and holy, right? With men, they they need to see it. So this is a, a warning about temporal consequences and correction. It has nothing to do with salvation of the soul. It's not talking about that. That's verse 15. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. All right, brother Ben, what do you say? So we're just are answering part A. Well, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah, read ahead. Are they are they are they connected? Do we have to discuss them? Uh, I, I didn't read ahead to, to I just well, no, I'll just cover part questions. A. We'll cover, yeah, we'll we'll cover part B secondarily. Um, we'll come back and do that if you don't mind. I'll just answer part A, like I think uh, Renee did. Uh, well, I, I I one of the things I think the paradigm that if if we start Hebrews off on the wrong paradigm, um, I think it's easy to get off track and misinterpret passages. And the paradigm that I find that works uh, harmonizes perfectly everything is the paradigm essentially of a, a tale of two sons almost. So uh, Jake, uh, Isaac had two sons, uh, Jacob, uh, which was uh, a picture of, well, Isaac himself was the, was the son of promise, but Jacob also kind of carried on that blessing. Or, uh, so you could be like Jacob, uh, or you could be like uh, Esau, which was sort short-sighted. So the, the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were not short-sighted. They had a long-term vision. They didn't live for the temporal. They uh, invested their lives into the eternal, the things that they had not yet seen, the promises. Whereas Isaac and Ishmael, uh, they were, they were, uh, well, it's supposed to be a, a picture of the flesh, I believe, and that's why he says that he's going to be a a, a a a jackass of a man. The 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 uh, flesh is 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 a jackass essentially. Um, and the uh, uh, Esau was short sighted. So don't he basically. I think the whole warning is again both both Esau and Jacob were sons of I, I Isaac. So again, it's, it's not a matter of, of salvation. They're both sons, but one son sowed to the flesh was short sighted. One son was long term sighted, and so that's the paradigm I approach Hebrews. Um, and again, it's a warning to them not to fail the grace of God. So again, it's not God's grace failing them, but they failed the grace of God. And and how would they fail the grace of God? Well, it's to it's to uh, be short sighted, to be only concerned about the things that they can see, the the things here and now, and not the eternal things. Um, and I believe that again, the rest in general, uh, is just like, uh, Egypt was a picture of escaping the penalty of sin, which is condemnation in hell. Uh, essentially, uh, you were, you know, you were freed from that, that law, that house of bondage. Um, whereas the promised land is a picture and 
it, it is the promised land equivalent, essentially, of uh, the spiritual rest that we receive. And one of the major themes of that spiritual rest in Hebrews is the millennium. Um, and so I, I think it's, again, essentially, uh, don't throw away your birthright that you have, uh, not only in, in eternity, but also the millennial pri privileges. Don't be short-sighted of that. Don't be like Esau. And again, Esau didn't care for his uh, uh, spiritual matters. He treated uh, earthly things um, like he, earthly and spiritual things. He didn't really have a regard for them. That's why he, he was profane. He profaned spiritual things. He considered them on par or equal to earthly things. And when when uh, bitterness occurs, um, when when you when you feel like you're hated by someone or you're mistreated by someone, if you internalize that. Uh, you're either going to uh, end up loathing yourself more, and you're gonna not, you don't feel like you're anything. You're, you're gonna hate yourself, and so you're gonna treat yourself. That's gonna manifest its, itself either by, uh, oftentimes through um, fornication or, or you know, uh, sexual uh, um, deviance, I guess, uh, or sexual impurity. And so you internalize it, or you're going to project that on someone else and mi mistreat them. And often, again, oftentimes that mistreat that mistreating can come out in the form of sexual. Um, you know, uh, you're going to go visit a prostitute or something to take out your your bitterness. And so uh, that's why I think he's saying, don't you know, bitterness. That's bitterness is in the realm of law. Essentially, it's you know, you're it's the the bitterness is not a fruit of the holy spirit it's a it's a it's a, it's a fruit of the flesh essentially so if, again if you're if you're bitter and you 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 feed that bitterness it's only going to re result in uh defiling yourself and other members of the church so that's why he tells to be uh, be on the lookout for it and don't let anyone uh become short sighted like Esau and say you know what i don't i i'm i'm bitter you know the heck with you guys i'm going back to the law uh, at least they want me there. You guys are treating me poorly. And so it's, it's essentially like Esau would go back and said, you know, you can have my birthright. I don't care about that. All I care about is feeding my flesh here and now. And so I'm going to, you know, I, I want, I, I want to feed my flesh. And one way they would do that spiritually is to go back to the law. Uh, can that Esau, the stew that he wanted was red and, uh, Esau was considered red. I think his name means red. Um, and it's, I think the picture of basically bloodlust, you know, like, like the Jews where they they want to sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. So it's like going back to the to the law so they could fulfill that that earthly, fleshly bloodlust, essentially. Whereas <clears throat> believers are not supposed to regard the flesh at all. We're supposed to be uh, regarding spiritual matters. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I'll ask, uh, uh, as I answer this question, uh, be patient. I guess, for let me give you the short, direct answer first. Uh, I'll say amen to the point that Renee made. I think uh, it really is the right way to interpret uh, verse 14 and 15. Uh, and that is that it's talking about um, see God in us individually and corporately as a, as a church. Um, if, um, if we say that we, uh, we have faith, uh, but then people observe us and they will say, what hypocrisy? Uh, they don't, uh, they, they're not uh, living the way that they're preaching. And this is one of the reasons that the world as a whole it re resists um, uh, Christianity is because they see so much hypocrisy. Uh, so I think this is talking about uh, seeing God um, in us uh, as a church. That, that's the correct way to, to understand it based upon the verse itself. But I, I want to talk about a couple other principles. And this is something you've heard me say before. And uh, Sister Renee is very talented uh, at uh, untwisting scriptures. Uh, you you say, well, what about this verse here? And she'll focus just like a laser beam on that verse explaining it. And, and she does an excellent job. Uh, I don't know anybody that does a better job. Uh, uh, that's why we call her the untwisted sister. Uh, 
but uh, I, I focus more on uh, the principles of hermeneutics, and which is just a fancy word that means how to study the Bible. And um, you're probably aware that in um, this congregation, Church of the Eternally Secure, we say that we have three core doctrines. Uh, and these core doctrines um, are dogmas. A dogma is as a position that is you're so uh, um, adamant that you insist uh, we have to all agree. We have to agree on these three things. Jesus is God Almighty. He's not merely a prophet. He's not merely uh, the first creation of God. He, he's not merely uh, a, a, a great moral teacher. He, he is God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, the other second point is that salvation and eternal life is a gift that God offers everybody by grace alone, only because God is being gracious, not because we have any merit that deserves it. Through faith alone, in other words, only because of our faith, not because of our own righteousness. And, and uh, that only our faith is only in Christ, not in anything else, and not in our ability to be religious, nothing apart from faith in the person and finished work and promise of Christ. <clears throat> so these are the three core doctrines. Now, why are these three things core doctrines, and why, why are they dogmas? Um, it's because we have such confidence that these are uh, true and easily proven because of the, the clarity of the scriptures and the number of the scriptures that, that uh, support these conclusions. Um, so that's why when we have a, a someone give us a what's called a problem verse, um, uh, we, we, we can certainly an answer, give you a direct answer about the verse, but I, I, I say, what about all the clear verses that, that contradict your conclusion? If your conclusion is that uh, somehow salvation depends upon our own behavior, our own righteousness, then, um, uh, and you'll give us some verses to support that, well, we can give you answers for those uh, as we just did. But really, why will you ignore all the clear verses that say that it's faith alone? Um, because we've got hundreds of verses that state it explicitly. And, and, and so not only is it clearly stated, the verses that support our core doctrines, but it's stated over and over and over again. So when it, you, when it comes to studying the Bible and, and forming your conclusions, and particularly your core doctrines, this is what we have to rely upon, the clear verses, not the ambiguous verses that everybody's arguing about. Now, I want to talk just for a moment about the book of Hebrews itself, is that it, it, Renee and I have said numerous times that it's one of our favorite books of the Bible. Uh, John, Hebrews, and Galatians are our top three books. Um, and, and the thing about Hebrews is the first chapter of Hebrews is the best chapter in the entire Bible to learn who Jesus is. That first chapter more clearly covers the deity of Christ than any other place in the scriptures. Uh, and, and then the rest of Hebrews, though, this is, the, this is what it's, is being said in a nutshell. Uh, the first believers in Jesus were the Jewish people. They also practiced Judaism. But what they didn't realize, most of them, is, is that, uh, that their faith has to be moved up away from Judaism and on to Jesus instead. Uh, you cannot have faith in Jesus and faith in your own religion as a means of salvation. So what happened is that uh, they were expected to give up Judaism, no longer uh, apply circumcision, worship it on the Sabbath, temple worship, animal sacrifices. That All that had to be left behind and discarded. And so that it's not part of Christianity, but there was a lot of pressure on uh, the Jewish believers, uh, and, and there was uh, peer pressure, pressure from their families, uh, because they loved their religion so much, they resent, resented if someone was leaving the religion. Matter of fact, so much that they 
put a death uh, a hit out on a death warrant on on the apostle Paul. They said this is the man that's saying that the laws of Moses are no longer a, a, a apply to us. So we're going to not eat until he's dead. Uh, this is how seriously they they, they took that. So the, the the Jewish believers in Jesus, um, they had a, a conflict. They would they put their faith entirely in Jesus and, and reject uh, Judaism, uh, or or would they compromise and say, okay, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to continue practicing Judaism. That's what the Book of Hebrews is about. This this issue, and the conclusion in the book is no, you you have to have your faith entirely in Jesus. It cannot be a blend of believing in Jesus and also your ability to practice Judaism. In this case, they're talking about animal sacrifices uh, in the book of Hebrews. Um, so, all right, I guess those are the main points I wanted to, to emphasize. Can I answer right. the second part yeah. of the question? Go ahead. Uh, oh, you're going to go to part B? I didn't read it yet. Oh, okay, go ahead. Then. You're going to read part B and then we'll go to that. But is there anything on the first part any more you want to say or Ben? What is that, on 15? Just verse 15? No, no, no. It, it, this question has part A and part B. I only read part A. Right, but I, it was, it, you said 15 through 17, and I only did 15. Yeah. Um, so can I discuss 16 and 17 or no? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Sure you can. Because yeah. I, I didn't get to that. I did one verse at a time. I wanted yeah. to put something out. Uh, Brother Ben's absolutely right uh, that um, Esau was short-sighted. So the warning here for them is don't be like Esau, who was short-sighted. All he cared about was what he wanted right now and gave nothing, like he said, to the spiritual ramifications of what he was giving up, things that should be precious to him. He didn't care about. He wanted what, what made him feel good right this minute, right? And so it's the same thing here. That's why it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. So don't give in to the lust of the flesh to feel good for this moment and then lose the spiritual blessing of your walk with the Lord and possibly deal with correction later, right? That's, that's what he's saying. But if you look at what he's explaining here, he's, he's reminding them about how the Israelites couldn't even get close to the mountain. Because if they got near the mountain, they'd be stoned to death. And they couldn't hear the sound of God's voice. It was too much for them. But now, but now uh, you are welcome. And you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven to God and judge of all in the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay. So he's uh, securing them in their salvation here. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of the sprinkling, speaketh better things than that of Abel. So <clears throat> he's reminding them when the Israelites first got there, that they are not to come to the mount that might be touched and burn with that fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tippet and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words and which voice they heard and treated as a word should not be spoken to them anymore. They couldn't even hear God speak. They could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, a beach, beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or, or, you know, or killed, basically. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But he said, but you have come before the Lord now. You don't have to be fearful that way. He's not going to kill you if you approach him. And so this is about how all of that's been done away with. And we can come to the throne of grace. But it is about correction, being short-sighted about feeding the flesh and what it wants right now, but making a suffering for something and a loss later, which would be a blessing, a healing. That's why he said, you know, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather be healed. So uh, this is temporal, earthly consequence of correction lack of blessing, uh, not to be short-sighted, but to uh, think first. Think about the, the loss you may suffer, not just for you, but for the church and for the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, 
I guess I'll go on to, uh, I'm very confused by the part A, part B, but I'll, I'll let me read part B now and then we'll answer it. The second part of the question is, verse 16 and 17 gives the example of Esau repenting after he sold his birthright, yet no matter how much we he repented with tears, he did not inherit the blessing. Some people get scared by this and liken this to losing salvation uh, if we sin too much, uh, as if God won't forgive us uh, if we sin to a certain point. Please untwist. And he has an answer, but I'll read his answer after we're finished here, or the questioner has an answer. Uh, okay, uh, Brother Ben, would you go first on that one? Sure. Um, this particular verse uh, troubled me for a little bit when I was first, um, uh, I was an early believer, but it uh, challenged by false doctrine. And I remember watching a video by, uh, I think it was Ray Comfort, and he loved, uh, and this tells, tells me a lot now, uh, he loved the book Pilgrim's Progress, which I think is a hardcore lordship uh, book. And the way they interpreted this this verse where uh, Esau was unable to repent, they basically said, oh, well, he was just so um, depraved and so um, such a reprobate that even though he, he repented, he couldn't stop sinning. He couldn't stop. Um, he, he was beyond he was beyond uh, he was beyond hope. He lost his salvation. I don't know if they said necessarily they lost his salvation, but they they basically suggested that uh, he was never saved. And he had hardened his heart and become so depraved that uh, he would cry and with many tears, but he couldn't repent, which means, uh, you know, turn from his sin and be saved. And, I, you know, so whenever I hear anyone says they like uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, that's uh, really troubling to me um, because I, I, I'm convinced now that this verse is not saying, well, again, I think the paradigm that uh, is important is that there are basically two lessons in Hebrew, I think, essentially, two major themes. One is uh, Christ is better than the law. Christ is better, 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 better. Uh, and so we should remember that. There's something better than, than what you knew before. That's one of the major overarching themes. And then secondarily, don't be sh short-sighted. Be like Abraham, who with patient endurance inherited the promises. Don't be like Esau, who forfeited his birthright. And again, it's a birthright. So that means you'd be born again to even be, be eligible for it. So I believe, again, uh, whether or not Esau was really saved in the Old Testament, that, that's immaterial really to this discussion but the argument that, that this that the, that the author of hebrews is laying forth is there's two sons uh and and again they're both sons of isaac so uh this is it, uh, basically illustrating or contrasting two different ways a, a born again believer could be uh uh in their relationship to god they could be faithful and endure uh, and patiently endure um the pro and inherit the promises or they could be like Esau, again, not has nothing to do with salvation whatsoever, or eternal salvation whatsoever. It's all everything to do with your birthright. And he's saying, well, with two patient endurance, Abraham inter inherited the promises. Again, it's not promises like singular, like eternal life. It's the promises that were added above and beyond the things that accompany salvation. They didn't neglect the salvation like Esau did in, in this illustration in Hebrews. They, they, uh, were long term and they patiently endured, and that's the whole exhortation, really, essentially all throughout Hebrews is is that Christ is better than the law, so don't go back to it um, like Esau did, essentially, and, and sought to feed his flesh. And the repentance there is, you know, again, if I if I have two sons and I'm I, I'm a father and I'm in my 90s and I'm dying on my deathbed uh, for the last five years, I've been battling cancer, and I had one of the sons patiently. Uh, attended to my every need while I was sick, and the other son was out doing his own thing. Um, when I, in my last will and testament, I'm likely to re reward that faithful son more so than the unfaithful son. Um, and again, they're both sons, they're both going to receive gifts from me, but one's going to be rewarded more greatly. Uh, like, like first, like Corinthians says that you know, if our, if our uh, works are burned up, you know, we'll still be saved, but uh, as through fire, um. And then Second Peter says, you know, if we add our add to these things to our faith, like uh, knowledge, um, long suffering, uh, brotherly love, etc., we'll we, we will receive an abundant kingdom entrance, and we will not be blind 
uh, and, and forgotten that we've been purged from our old sins. And so, um, again, that's the lesson here is that if, if you're, if you're going to be like Esau, don't you, you can forfeit things, but it's not, you can't forfeit salvation, but you can forfeit your privileges and blessings with regards to your birthright. Again, you have to be poor to even be entitled to a birthright. So that's all this, these verses are referring to uh, is that if you if you go back to the law, essentially, I think he's basically saying is that there's going to be a point where you're not going to be able God, you can cry about it all you want and be sorrowful, but uh, that faithful son is going to receive the rewards, not you. You, you, are, you are in risk and in danger of losing some of your birthright privileges and blessings, but not eternal salvation. I think that's all that that's referring to. Uh, you know, he he sought repentance again, change of mind with tears. It, it wasn't his repentance; it was his father's change of mind. He wanted he, he cried to his father, Isaac, please. Uh, I'm sorry that I, I gave up my birthright. I want it back. And and his father said, No, you 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 you've given it up. You you, uh, you sealed the deal essentially with with uh, by by giving it up to your brother. And so he will be blessed. You will not in terms of birthright privileges. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's right on that. The beginning of this is talking about correction and chastisement uh, and Esau being uh, short-sighted, like he said, uh, only caring about what he wanted now and feeding that. And God is just saying no. Because we'll suffer consequences. You're going to feel bad. You did it, but it's going to be too late because now you're going to have some suffering, some earthly consequences. However, it goes on to show us how God deals with you in the law versus how he deals with you under the new covenant. And so that's what's being a, kind of a new situation is being discussed as we move on from Esau. Okay. So he's telling the Hebrew people, hey, remember when you were at Mount Sinai, how horrifying it was. You couldn't even hear the trumpet. It was like God was, it was a trumpet blaring. You couldn't even hear God's voice. You asked him to stop. Please don't talk to us directly. Uh, if you even touched the side of the mountain, you'd die. You'd have to be stoned to death. If a beast accidentally, if a goat actually went over there and brushed aside that holy mountain and touched it because he's unclean, he's got to be killed. You see, he's trying to show us that's how God deals with you under the law. It's death. It's condemnation. It's fear. All right. I mean, I mean, fear, fear. Right. Let's look at it. And this, you were not come to the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they had heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. They begged Moses, tell God not to talk to us. For they could not endure that which was commanded. For if so much as a beast touched the mountains, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. That's how you're dealt with under the law. But, but, okay, now we're going under the new covenant. This is how he's dealing with you now. But ye are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel offered the blood of a lamb, which was pleasing to God because it was a shadow of Jesus being the lamb of God. But we uh, are under a better covenant than that because that that was just a shadow. The lamb Abel offered was an animal. Jesus is the, the real, the good thing that's come. It's the fulfillment of that. So it's even better than what righteous Abel did. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Why? Because he spoke to you this way under the law where you drop dead if you even touched uh, the holy mountain, right? Or came near it. You couldn't even bear to hear his voice. You couldn't endure what was commanded. All right. But now, see, it's about don't go back to that. It's not better. Like Ben was saying, the, the, the law is not better. Okay. It's just to show you your need for a savior. Now, 
uh, a lot of people don't get this. They, I don't know why Nori was saying, I don't know why people think there's no consequence for sin just because we tell you you're secure. There is, especially if you're his child. And we've all taught that. So I guess people just don't like that they're not going to hell for the sin. They want more punishment for those people because they think they're good or something. But anyway, he's trying to say that this is how God's dealing with you now. Uh, yeah, he says, uh, uh, to the spirits of just men made perfect. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Okay, that was in reference to the law. Now, how much more problems will you have if you reject him under this covenant? Okay, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word. Yes, once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. He's going to shake everything, but the kingdom we are in cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God. Okay, we say by serving God? No. We may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. He's reminding the Israelites of the fear of the Lord, how terrifying it was under the law. But now, you know, we are under a new covenant, a covenant of just men made perfect. And so that should encourage them to serve him and to realize uh, that there will be correction and that we should serve him with reverence, right? Serve him acceptably. In addition, he reminds them the law was not better. You actually had less access to God. And it was him commanding, demanding of you that you could not do. You, you couldn't endure what he commanded. But now under grace, Jesus is the mediator. It's been done. Uh, and let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So um, it's a, a double thing here. It's reminding them how God dealt with them under the law. He, he speaks to the Hebrew people differently than Paul speaks to the Gentiles because they would not have known, most of them would have known these stories. Timothy grew up on the scriptures because his mother was a Jewess. So um, it is a warning for them not to put their trust in the Old Testament, but also in the New, but also uh, to not uh, feed their flesh and be short-sighted and, and think about what they want right now, not realizing there will be a consequence. Because not, God's not much, you reap what you sow. And after all he's done for us, we no longer die when we approach him like we did under the law. Uh, that should motivate us. Uh, to remain in his grace and serve the Lord. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to take my turn to talk about something else. Uh, it, um, you know, b before we start each program, uh, there's a, a probably three or four minutes where we post um, what's called a, a chat room protocols uh, and it's up there long enough for you to read you could pause it if you need to to, to read it more carefully but we we established uh, certain rules because this is church I, I know we're not under one roof but we still consider this church we're trying to conduct it just as though we're under one roof and so we we had some meetings and established some guidelines or, or, or rules of conduct here. And uh, I know that we get some people here who are here for the first time or, and maybe maybe they're here for the first time and they're really interested and uh, they, they don't have any uh, Ill, Ill will or bad intentions, but we do have trolls that come in here too. And, and their only intention 
is to stir up trouble, uh, uh, make charges against us, uh, or to distract us. Because in church, uh, whatever, if it's a Bible study, a church service, or, there's a subject that's being discussed. And uh, normally, I, I, you shouldn't have to say to everybody, uh, hey, why are you all talking about something different? This is not, that's not the subject that's being, being taught right now. Can't we all stay on the same subject? Well, that happens to be one of the rules of the, the, the chat room protocols is that if you want to come in here, stay on the topic that's being discussed. Don't come in here and introduce other topics that are not relevant. Now, if someone comes in and they don't know the gospel and they, we need to help them with that, then we will assign someone, if, they're, if the person is not a troll, if they're, if they're really interested, we'll assign someone, a moderator or an elder in the church, to try to talk to them one-on-one uh, -on -one to help them. But we, we can't allow our church service to be hijacked by, by any person that comes in here, and they have the right to come in, and now they get to change the subject, and we all have to talk about whatever they want to talk about. That's not the way this is supposed to work. So we have moderators that we can sit, we call them the deacons of the church, and it's their responsibility to deal with these things. And uh, so, uh, but that's what I see going on. And it's, um, there, there, there are reasons. Uh, maybe, uh, I thought that having that notice up there on, on the, the, the type of conduct that we expect from everybody, that that should be enough. But uh, what I believe is that if, if I asked everybody right now, just answer this to yourself. Have you actually read the, the protocols, the, the guidelines? Uh, because it seems to me that very few people have even read the guidelines. So no wonder you're not following them if you haven't taken the time to read them. So I'm, I'm telling you a couple of points, but you really need to read those guidelines and please uh, conduct yourself within the guidelines that we've all agreed upon so that we can conduct church. All right, any more on this question or anything before we go to the next question? Uh, I would just add a couple other uh, things that um, <clears throat> the backup Renee's interpretation, um, well, I think we all agreed, but um, the, the, again, they were, I think these Hebrews were being uh, encouraged, like Luke said, and uh, Strongly encouraged, uh, and even threatened, perhaps to. Um, well, I, I do believe they were threatened to go back to the law. They were, you know, their old family members uh, and friends. They were encouraging them to go back to the law. They, so that was one reason they were considering going back. I believe the uh, they were also had forgotten that that they were being chased, chased out, chastened by the Lord. So they had forgotten why. They were being chastened. So I think again, it's a kind of parallel to um, when Joshua and Caleb gave gave the report, and there was the, the spies that gave a negative report that they were supposed to they were you know to take the land and to press on to maturity essentially, but many of them refused to do so, uh, and so they stayed behind. And that's basically what was happening to these um, to these Hebrews in this in in, in this epistle is that uh, they were on the kind of at the brink of, of either pressing forward or staying back and wandering and going nowhere essentially and even potentially going back to the law and uh and being being consumed i believe with the at the 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 um the fire that devour, that devours the adversary so they'd be caught in the in the temporal wrath of god on unbelievers um that wasn't aimed for them but nonetheless they would if they were uh you know uh, thick in it, they were, they're going to get caught up in it so that they're being encouraged to press on to maturity. And that's why, uh, they're encouraged to say, no, you, you've forgotten that you're being chased out, chastened. That's a loving action of God. Not, you're not being punished. You're God's not, uh, call, cause asking you to move on. Cause the, during the, uh, Joshua, they said, oh, there's giants in the land. You know, God's basically leading us to destruction. And the author of Hebrews saying, no, that you're, you, that's not what's happening at all. In fact, you need to press on, or you 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 will be destroyed uh, temporarily, not eternally, but temporarily. And so that's why you need to press on to maturity. Um, and I, so again, I, and also to the word gospel in Hebrews, I don't believe it has anything to do with the 
the gospel of Jesus Christ in terms of eternal salvation. It's a, a general term of good news. Like like the spies, they gave bad news where Caleb and, and Joshua said, this is good news. Let's press on. No, no, we can't take the land. God is with us. He is going to fight our battles for us. And um, yet many refuse to believe that. And so it, it's, it's a call to, uh, like, like Renee said, uh, gird up your loins and move forward. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. So we move on to the next question. All right. Question number two is lordship argument for losing salvation is that God respects your free will. So it would be unjust of God to still keep you saved if you wanted to walk away from him. So if eternal security was true, that means that God doesn't ultimately respect your free will, yet we know he does. Please refute this reasoning. Um, let me see. I think it's uh, Renee's turn to go first, isn't it? I don't know. I don't, it, ben doesn't mind. I'll do it. Yeah, um, you, were, you were A. Ben was B, so it's your turn again. Well, I would like to say this. For, that's a really – it's just man's – ridiculous thinking. They always want a loophole for bad news when it comes to God. All right. Let's say a person, since God knows the end from the beginning, is he going to give, it tells us that God gives us to Jesus, right? And we're in Jesus's hands and the father's hands, right? All the father gives me, I shall lose nothing, right? But raise him up at the last day. So the father gives us to Jesus. He's not going to give someone to Jesus he can't keep. And so here's the thing. The person, here's the message of what Jesus is. Now, I have heard a lot of so-called, I heard one atheist debater the other night claim he was a born-again Christian pastor with the Church of Christ. No, you weren't. You were not born again if you were a member of the Church of Christ because they got another gospel. And it's all about how you live and water baptism. So these people were never saved. Never. They didn't from us because they were not of us. I believe that. But once somebody is saved, they hear the message of what Jesus did for them on Calvary. They put their trust in it. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Their spirit was dead. It's been quickened, brought back to life in Christ. Once you are in Christ, you can't get out of Christ. Do you understand? You're already seated in heavenly places. Now, the silly question is, well, that person doesn't want to go to heaven. They want to burn. They want their free will. They want to burn. No, they don't. Nobody really wants to perish. They might hate God. They might get mad at God because some things happen. But do you think God's going to forsake his child because they're rebellious and in pain? Most people leave God because they're angry and hurt because they don't understand why something happened to him that them that hurt them so much. OK, God's not going to forsake his child when they're in that place. If my son was uh, angry at me and in pain, uh, I, I still wouldn't stop loving him. And I certainly wouldn't kick him out of the family just because it was his free will not to be in the family anymore. He's still my blood. It doesn't matter. Even if, let's say I said it. Okay, fine. He's no longer part of the family. Does it make it true? No. You know why? Because he was born uh, of my blood. He's my son. And so when I was born of God, I was born into his family. So it doesn't matter. I was born genetically different of new spiritual DNA. It's the best, it's a physical way of saying what happened, but it's true. I was born into God's family. I was justified in the sight of God and whom he justified, he also glorified. He is not going to justify me and then not give me a glorified body. He is not going to have me be born into his family knowing that later he can't keep me. It doesn't happen. See, see, God is the author and finisher of my faith. Jesus is. He's the one that keeps us. 
So even if a rebellious child through their free will says, I don't want to go to heaven, it's ridiculous. It doesn't matter what you want because you're not yours anymore. You were purchased and bought with a price. It's already done. It can't be undone. I know everybody wants to find a way people can lose salvation, even if it comes down to God respecting our free will choice. He will respect your free will choice to be in rebellion and, and destroy yourself. Yes, he will. Go right ahead. That'll happen. He's not going to stop you from rolling in the mud with the pigs and even dying. But you're his child. You don't stop being his child because you were born into the family. My son was born into my family. He will never stop being my son, no matter what his free will wants. He was purchased. We were purchased by Jesus's blood. We belong to him. And so, you know, God knows the end from the beginning. Are there people that claim to have been born again? Uh, yeah. Were they? No. No. There, there's never any, there's not one place in scripture. Now, there's a lot of places people twist up or misunderstand, but there's not one place in scripture where somebody was born of God into the family and unborn and lost their salvation. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. You're born into God's family, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, brand new spiritual DNA. You are in his family. You were purchased. You belong to him. You're his. You're his. So it doesn't matter. No, that's not possible for you once you're saved to go, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell now. It's, it's a silly like man's argument is all it is. And no, it cannot happen. All right. Thank you. All right, Brother Ben. Uh, yeah, it, it is a silly man's argument. In fact, it's more than silly. It's, it's a brain dead argument. I mean, uh, we're we're free to make choices, but we're not free to choose the consequences of those choices. Uh, the Bible says the gift and calling of God is without repentance. So if you receive the gift, uh, God's not taking it back. He's not changing his mind. Furthermore, the calling, once you receive that gift, that calling, you have a calling on God to uh, live a holy life. And, and to grow in him. That's not a choice that every believer, you don't, as a believer, you don't get that choice. You may rebel against it, but you're going to pay the consequences. But God, it's a package deal. When you receive eternal life, you also have a holy calling on you to uh, grow and in, 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 uh, mature in Christ. Uh, and if you fail to do that, you're going to, you're going to uh, experience the consequences. Uh, if I go and murder someone, that was my free choice to do that, but I can't undo the consequences. So if you can't do it, if you can't do it on, on, on a temporal level, how can you, how can you think you could do it on a, on a, on an internal level? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, the old man, when you believe on Christ, the old man died. The old man is a sinful man. The new man cannot sin. So uh, what, can you say that, that the, that the new man would say, Oh yeah, I want to go to hell. Is that a righteous thing to do? The, the new man is completely perfectly righteous. He cannot sin it to, to want to die and be, uh, you know, uh, not to be with God. That's just, that's, I mean, if that's not sin, I don't know what is. And that is from the, uh, the new man can't do such a thing. He can't think such a thought. Whereas the old man, he died. So it doesn't matter what he wants anymore. He died. He, he, he's passed out of existence. So um, it's so silly. People come up with this stuff and it's, it's, it's really demonic, really that it's such a thought that, uh, that you would, uh, you, that someone would teach that you could, you could give your salvation back. It's uh it's a failure to understand the power of God, the promises of God, uh, perfect righteousness. And um, again, it's putting confidence in the flesh, really. And uh, that's exactly what we're not to do. Um, so many things I was thinking about when Renee was talking, but I can't think of them now. Maybe I'll come back later. But uh, yeah, it, it's impossible. It, the Bible itself says the gift and calling of God, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So you can, uh, so sad, too bad, you, you can't give it back. That was funny. You said, "What? It doesn't matter what the dead guy wants." Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that guy's already dead. It doesn't matter. Nori in the chat said, "It's like saying your parents don't respect your free will because you can't be unborn out of their bloodline." It's the same thing. You're, you're born yep. into the family. You can't undo that. What they don't get what a birth is. Right. Yeah. Well. Um... <clears throat> 
I, I agree completely that uh, it is, let me say it this way, it's BS, whatever that stands for. <laughs> that nobody actually believes that there is a uh, literal burning torture place, hell, and they want to go there instead of heaven, whatever we imagine heaven to be people think of heaven as being a wonderful place and hell as being a horrible place and you want me to believe that someone is actually saying i don't want to go to heaven i want i choose to go to hell and be tortured and burn i mean that is that's so dishonest it's an insult to anybody's intelligence that you expect me to believe that that's what you would prefer so it, it is bs in the first place but let me refute it in another way, though. Uh, the um, free will, yes, we have free will to to uh, come to Christ, faith, or, or not. And uh, um, if a person exercises their free will and decides that they uh, are, with their free will, they want to jump off, Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam is here outside Las Vegas, and a lot of people have jumped off that over the many years and, and, and committed suicide. And if a person exercises their free will and they jump to their death, uh, just because that is irreversible, they can't get their life back. They can't, they, they, they change their mind. Uh, does that mean they don't have a free will? No, because they exercise free will to do something that is uh, un, undoable. Un, un, uh, what is the word? Um, unchangeable, immutable. Irreversible. 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 It's or immutable. It, it can't. It can't be changed. That's what God is immutable. God can't doesn't change. But the. Uh, if a person exercises free will to kill themselves, uh, is it that they don't have free will uh, because they can't undo that and reverse it? No, they, they made the decision uh, exercising their free will. It doesn't mean that, that free will does no longer applies. It just it means that they, the free will decision that they made had a consequence that, that it can't be changed. Once you jump off there, you're dead. You can't undo that. It's the same thing with receiving eternal life. Once you receive eternal life, if you if just if you just define what that you actually got, eternal life, you've got life that will go on forever and ever and ever. And you believed and you got it. So how could you uh, exercise free will to, to uh, uh, get, uh, not have eternal life? Because you, you never would have had eternal life in the first place if you could change it. So uh, it, it's, an absurd, it's an absurd concept in the first place, and it's also a very dishonest uh, statement because no one, if, if they really believed that in, in a real heaven and a real hell, no one would ever choose to go to hell. To, to even say that you would choose to go to hell, you don't want to go to heaven, you've changed your mind. I have free will, I changed my mind, I don't want to be with Jesus, I want to go to hell instead. Come on, that's BS. It, it just don't don't insult our intelligence by even saying such a thing. All right. I think they have to do that because um, they know that the scripture is is, is crystal clear um, that sin is not a factor. Sin is not a factor in salvation, and uh, works is not a, salv a factor. Yet they want an escape clause or something to explain difficult passages that would. Uh, that they don't understand. So they come up with this fanciful death. It's desperation to come up with some possible way that someone uh, either never believed, or if they believe they, they, they willfully gave it back. It's it, that's what, this is the fruit of that kind of thinking, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any more Renee? Should we go on? I wanted to address the issue of first of all yeah i i don't believe anybody would genuinely just say no i want to go to hell instead it's just silly i think it's like is god to, can god do whatever he wants can you pick up make a rock so big you can't break or you know lift it it's just 
silly man's vain imaginations is what I think. But um, someone had said, well, you know, it's kind of a one sided thing with under the threat of torture. No, uh, uh, we were given the information that we all die without Jesus. We inherited that from Adam. Not fair, but that's just the way it is. That's the way it is. And he came as the second Adam to reverse that. And so if you reject his blood, it's not his fault. He's just letting you know you're going to be twice dead, plucked up by the roots, as the Bible says, if you reject it. Because you were born that way. You were born lost. You needed to be reconciled to God. Uh, you were born dead. And you need to be uh, alive in Christ to be uh, reconnected to God, to have e eternal life, immortality. Uh, without him, that's just the way you're born. You inherited it from Adam. That's what Romans talks about. So it's not that somebody's threatening people under torture if they don't receive Christ. He's letting them know uh, their position, that they need to be reconciled to God. And that they are not immortal. They don't have eternal life. And God wanted them to have it. He wanted us all to be in his family. But we had to be reconciled to him through what Jesus did. So it's not God's fault. We, we inherited that. We inherited death from Adam. And Jesus freely gives us eternal life or immortality back through him. That's why it's the one man Adam all die. Through one man, God in the flesh, Jesus, all have life. That's, that's simple. It's not, nobody's threatening people with torture. It's just, you were born dead and you need to be brought to life be, to have your immortality returned. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I guess we'll go to the next question. Question three is, um, what do you think of this Lordship saying? Obedience doesn't get you into heaven, but it keeps you out of hell. Brother Ben? <laughs> Peace. Um, okay, if it doesn't keep you, it doesn't get you into heaven, but it keeps you out of hell. Um, well, that's impossible. There's only heaven or hell, unless there's a third place they're suggesting you, you could go. Because if it be, obedience does get you into heaven, uh, well, then where are you, you going to go? Um, Again, another ridiculous saying um, that makes no sense, counter to scripture. Uh, obedience is is uh, obedience to works or obedience to a law. We know that doesn't get anyone into heaven. And, and uh, we know that uh, obedience can't uh, save anyone from hell either because no one is 100% obedient. That's the thing that they would fail to see is that it the law requires 100% perfection. Uh it, it not only in the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So uh, works can't can't get you into heaven. Uh, works can't keep you out of can't keep you out of hell. Uh, sin can't get you. A uh, 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 lack of sin can't can't uh, earn you heaven. Or uh, yeah, so lack of sin can't keep you out of heaven. And it, but it can condemn you to hell. So again, really, two things that people are struggling with is okay. Uh, if you don't believe in eternal security, then then by default, you must be relying on one of two things. You're either relying on uh, your ability to uh, uh, th stop sinning, or you're relying on works. And both the scripture is uh, loud and clear that um, works, you cannot be justified by works. Justification means declared righteous, uh, which that's what allows you to enter, enter into eternity. <clears throat> and sin also. Uh, needs to be taken care of, and only through Christ are, are we uh, without sin and 100% obedience. So your our only hope is Christ. And so, uh, again, th this verse here, I don't see any mention of Christ at all. It's called, I see the word "you" in it, and when you when you are in part of the uh, part of the equation, uh, that's a, a false gospel. So uh, that's all I would say about that for now. You know these Lord Troopers, man. They just have these these I, these double talking confusion. Works don't save you, but if you don't have the works, you're not really saved. All right, it's free, but it'll cost you everything. 
All right, whatever. I'm just, I'm so sick of the double talk. God's not the author of that confusion. Uh, so in this one, it's obedience doesn't get you into heaven, but it keeps you out of hell. Well, since there's only two places to go, they're saying it does get you to heaven. But I would answer this. Obedience to what? Obedience to what? The Bible says we got to obey the gospel and that will be judged by my gospel, Paul preached. And that was uh, obedience to the gospel or obey the gospel means to believe on Christ, to believe the message of what he accomplished on Calvary, paid your sin debt and gave you eternal life. If you're saying obedience to the gospel, which means to believe it, yeah. But when they say obedience, I want them to say what they're really saying. I am so sick of this double talk and euphemism. Obey what? We know what they're saying to obey. They don't want to say law because they know by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in this sight. So what they'll probably say is commandments. Command What commandments? Again, it's the law. They just won't say it. They won't say that we believe you have to obey the law plus Jesus to be saved. So they really believe they are keeping the law to God's standard, that they don't sin. I have heard people flat out tell me they have stopped sinning. And I'm like, wow, that was a sin right there. You have no idea how much you fall short. You know, uh, they get in their flesh like everybody else. Everybody has sinful flesh. It's just ridiculous. So I would say, for one, it's just a bunch of double talk and confusion in the way that it's put out. Two, I'd say obedience to what? If you're saying obey the gospel, then yeah, it will keep you out of hell because that's what we're supposed to do. Believe the gospel, obey the gospel. Obedience unto life is also to believe the gospel. Um, but obedience, they don't want to say the law, so they'll say commandments. Uh, sometimes they'll try to use, say, Jesus's teaching. You have to obey Jesus's teachings uh, to forgive everyone and love them, it, which is all the heart of the law. It's just, it's just them saying you have to keep the law, which is making salvation about you. As Ben pointed out, the word you is in there. There's nothing about Jesus. It's all about you. This, this is no different than any other false religion, that salvation is based on something you do and your righteousness. Uh, but no, salvation is a gift we get because Jesus had to reverse what the first Adam messed up. And nobody could do that but Jesus. That God came in the form of sinful flesh, lived as a man, lived the perfect sinless life, and laid his life down to pay our sin debt. That God's justice and wrath, it's all been met. You know, a propitiation, full and final payment for our sin. So it's just another way these people add works of the law to the gospel message. Now, those of us that are tr uh, trusting only in what Jesus did, and we say you can't be justified by the law, we're not telling you to murder and commit adultery or that those things are okay. There's still consequence on this earth for that stuff. And I don't understand why they can't get it, that we're not telling you to break God's law just because trying to keep it doesn't save you. You know, don't trust in anything you're doing is all we're saying. It doesn't save. There's still consequence for breaking them, but it's just not damnation. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody can be justified by the law. What does he say? Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified without the deeds of the law. And Paul says that Christ is of no effect unto you, whosoever you're justified by the law, you fall from grace. No effect. That means you either have Jesus and what he did and his righteousness on your account, or you have your own by the law and you will be found wanting because Romans 5, 19 says, for as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. And I would just say, uh, are you the one? No, you're not the one. Jesus was the one whose obedience mattered. Yeah, it's a great question. Are you the one? <laughs>
<laughs> well, I'm glad you made me laugh there because I was getting, getting quite irritated, not with your answers, but just with the whole scenario. Right. The, uh, you know, over the years, I've watched a lot of people try to engage the Lordship heretics um, in discussions, in debates on these live streams. And uh, as I watch them, I, I, all it does is really just irritate and agitate me because um, what we're, we, we're normally are doing is being just real patient and, and try they, whatever verse they throw at us, we'll try to explain it to them, give them the context and give them the right answer and stuff. And then they, it goes in one ear, out the other. They don't listen at all. They got another verse waiting for you. Uh, and it, it's, it's really casting pearls to swine. They don't have ears to hear. We should, first of all, be able to recognize, have enough discernment to recognize if someone is really listening, going to listen or not. The other thing that aggravates me is it, it, when you read the scriptures, you see that the time that Jesus uh, got upset wasn't with the prostitute, what wasn't wasn't with the uh, the publican. It was with the religious leaders. Uh, what did he say about them? It was quite insulting. Uh, I think that spiritual pride and self righteousness just made him sick, and it makes me sick too. And that's what we're 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 dealing with when people give me the, give us these kinds of arguments. They are deluded, thinking that they actually are uh, able to to make themselves perfectly acceptable to God. And that you have to do the same thing. First of all, they're trying to impose things on you that they're not even able to do themselves. If you ask them, well, have you completely stopped sinning? Well, no, they'll, they'll normally admit, no, I haven't, but I, I feel bad about it or something, or I don't want to sin. I my attitude, You know, it's, it's a bunch of double talk. They haven't got sin out of their life. And if they, if they think they have, it's because they've watered the commandments down diluted them into what we call easy legalism. They say we have easy believism. Yeah, we do. But they have easy legalism. They, they make the law uh, so easy to follow. Like, well, let's see, let me see. I stopped lying and I haven't killed anybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. But they haven't, it doesn't dawn on them that even that statement is a sin because they're expressing pride in themselves, self-righteousness. Uh, so uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't follow the, the rules that they're trying to impose on us. They can't, they can't do it because it's impossible. This is the conclusion they, they need to come to. This is the conclusion that Jesus said, all right, finally, the apostles, you, you get it. Because after the rich young ruler conversation, the apostles asked Jesus, then how is it possible? Uh, how can anyone be saved? Because Jesus says, you, if, you, if you're sinning, you better cut off your hand, gouge out your eyes, uh, go and be perfect, go and sin no more. All these things Jesus said that finally dawned on them that we can't do it. And he said, yeah, that's right. It's impossible. You need to realize it's impossible. But the Lordship heretics... They don't get that. They don't realize it's impossible. They think that they're able to do it, or at least they're they're either deluded or lying to themselves and, and to us. Do they really believe it? Uh, I, I don't think so. But the other thing, they need to be confronted with their sin so that they, they uh, uh, and, and if you ask them also, well, uh, okay, we all, we established that you haven't completely stopped sinning. So you're, you're, Certainly not going to be able to go before God and and plead your case that you stopped sinning because that you know you didn't. But but what about all the good works that you're saying are necessary? Would you show me your resume of good works? What did what did you do when you woke up this morning until this present time? Your day must have been full of charitable works. Did you go out and feed the poor and clothe, clothe the naked and visit the people in the prison? And, and what did you do? I'm eager to hear all all the things you did. You didn't do it today. Well, you must have done it yesterday. Come on. Well, what did you do 
this week, did you do any good deeds, any work, good works? They're, they don't have a resume of good works. They're, it's a bunch of lies. I'm not going to accept their lies. They haven't stopped spinning. They don't do the, the works. It's, a, it's, it's all a delusion that they're under, and then they're trying to impose it on us. And I would also say to them, well, maybe if you think you understand the Bible, maybe you can help me. Can you interpret this verse for me? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Uh, I could give you 20 verses like that right now. Uh, but they're all, I want the Lordship heretic to teach me the meaning of these verses. These verses are clear, they're explicit. They're saying that here's one that would really, they'd have a hard time uh, with. It says, uh, How about for him that worketh not? That's Look. the one I'm looking for. Okay, for to, to him that worketh not, but believeth on the one who justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. I used to think when it says to the man that worketh not, I would say, see, this person didn't do one single work his whole life. So how many works do you have to do? Zero. You don't have to do any works at all. But I've come to believe that it's really saying to the man that worketh not for his salvation. Are you someone who's working for your salvation? Well, this says you may have to be someone who's not working for your salvation. If you're working for your salvation, then you can't have it. Yeah, you have to be someone who's not working for your salvation. You're not believing. It's on the one who justified the ungodly. Amen, amen, Luke. Amen. Mm -hmm. So there, I think we just need to be, uh, smack them around a little bit um, and not be, not be so diplomatic and say, you're a hypocrite. You're full of spiritual pride. It makes me sick. I'm sure it makes Jesus sick because you are not righteous on your own. It says in, in Romans 10, 3, you're trying to, they're trying to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of Christ. You need Christ's righteousness credited to you through faith in him alone. No faith in your own righteousness. You have to reject that and say, I have no righteousness of my own. Uh, so you're, you're exactly what the scripture is warning us about. Someone that's trying to establish their own righteousness thinking that that's, that's the way to get to heaven. But that's not God's way. The Bible says that's not God's way. <clears throat> All right. Um, any more, Renee or Ben? Yeah, I got fired up because you were getting me going there. Sorry. I was going, yeah, amen, Luke, in the background. Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. <laughs> yeah, if it be a grace, it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, it, it's honestly, I tell these people, they always have the argument, when you ask them, well, I don't willfully sin because they think that's what Hebrews 20, 10, 26 is saying, that if you willfully sin, you receive, you know, so they mess that up. And, and so they think, oh, I, I don't sin on purpose. Like uh, I make mistakes, but I don't sin on purpose. And so they're really like deceived, like you said. And if they're honest with themselves, there's only two things that Lordship can do. It can either make you self-righteous and blind to your own sin, your own failings. Or it makes you crazy in condemnation and fear because you're aware of God's standards being perfection and you don't reach it. Um, so I, I like to tell them there's only two types of righteousness and they cannot be mixed. Uh, for him that worketh not says it clearly. If you're working for your salvation, then you're not believing on the one who justifies the ungodly. You're, you're trusting for yourself to be godly enough. You need to be believing on the one who justifies the ungodly or makes the ungodly righteous, imputed righteousness. The bottom line is most of these people are relying on their own righteousness. And Jesus is not going to share the glory. It is not. It's Jesus and what he did on Calvary or it's you. There is no mixture of the two. And that's why Lordship damnation is so dangerous because it sounds close to the truth because it's got the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in it, but it's really making it about what you do. Persevering to the end, living the good Christian life, getting the sin out of your life. Now, meanwhile, they're never born again. Never. 
and, and because they never believed the gospel message. It's very scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Mike says, um, uh, that, but then they say faith without works is dead. Well, I mean, there should come a point where you recognize who you're dealing with. I mean, the, 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 the scripture is very clear. We have um, wheat and tares. We have sheep and goats. And we have swine. I mean, the nerve of that man, Jesus, calling people swine. Wow, that's pretty harsh. Well, that, until you realize that we are dealing with swine, according to Jesus, people that are no better than a pig. Why would he say such a thing? Look, look how uh, irritating it is. Because it's irritating because I think we all know that that it, they're wasting our time. Why don't we? Why don't we spend our time spreading a thousand seeds and and watering these seeds instead of uh, focusing on one seed that's stubborn, that will that will not that is the, it's hard and it won't crack through and come to life. Uh, don't put all your time into the person that's a swine and you're just casting pearls to it. Dust off your feet and move on. Spend your time spreading seeds to somebody who might have ears to hear. We need to use some discernment. I mean, I, I've had to do a lot of that because of the street preaching. If I've got hundreds of people listening and one person is going to come up here and try to, same thing that people do here in this church program, that they try to take you away from your, your mission to pr present the gospel to everybody. Instead, they want to present you, get, get you into an argument that, that they're, they're not even listening. So we need to recognize what's going on and not allow them to, to uh, steal our attention and time away from the people who actually have ears to hear. Yeah, it's true. It's very frustrating. I, I can't tell you, Brother Luke, one time I had one guy on my channel for a long time. I posted the verse for him that worketh not. And all I did was ask him, what does this mean? 14 times I posted it. He come back with some other argument, faith by works is dead, or Jesus said you must do this, or if you don't do that. Some verse out of context, right? And all I did was say, again, I'll answer that, but I need you to answer what this means 14 times. And eventually you just went away. You just would not answer it. So the thing is, like you said, you, you can show people these things. You can preach the gospel. But what's bad, Brother Luke, is there's some people that I believe would uh, convert to the gospel and are just giving verses they've heard and go, well, what about this? They're not being hostile. They really want answers because they've been taught by like John MacArthur or Paul Washer. And, and they're really honestly saying, well, there's this verse, though. How do we deal with that? And so we never know which one is doing it just to be a pain or which one is actually in need of assistance. So I do my best to answer those questions so that others can see them in case they're having the same issue. I, 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 I think that we do know. I think we, we do know. I think we, we are pretty darn intelligent people. And I think we are capable of discerning the difference between those two people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying when we see it in comments, we don't know, like if somebody puts, what about this verse? I do try to answer it though, because I'm not sure. You know what I mean? But you can tell because the other ones will troll and accuse and that kind of thing. That's different. But there are people out there that are just taught wrong by these big ministries and do have questions. And so I just wanted them to know we're, we're we will answer them. If there's people that have verses that are stumbling blocks for them and they need understanding, we will answer them. And I was saying in the chat, to send them in an email to us, like as they come up, because somebody was mentioning that sometimes watching it makes them have more questions. So hopefully they'll send them to us. Yeah, uh, actually, I was there that I was that person 10 years ago where uh, I was desperate to uh, find the grace, but I was having difficulty because I'd see verses 
uh, like uh, I think First Corinthians six nine, where it says, uh, you know, fornicators. Uh, that, that list of verse of, of sins it says that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I, I had serious questions, so I did pose it as a challenge to people that I knew were free gracers, because um, I wanted them to answer it. And they kind of responded to me in, in a, uh, well, and, and it, they smacked me around a little bit, but I, I was okay with that. I was happy. I was I was happy to find someone who could help me neutralize uh, the the thorns and help me find the the honey of grace. And um, and I, again, I was I was desperate for that. And and uh, over the years, I just kept building myself up over and over. I think the Lord was helping me big time. I again, I prayed for good teachers, and he. Uh, uh, responded uh, more than I could ever hope for, um, and I, I, again, I found I found come up finding grace and grace. But there are so there are people that are, are interested in. They may come off as a little standoffish at first, but if they persist in that stand in, in that hot, if they're absolutely hostile. I think, like you said, we we can know pretty quickly. But there are people that will uh, pose a challenge because they, they are desperate to learn the truth and understand what that verse is really saying. So. Yeah, somebody, Nathan, was saying yesterday, he talked to a lady from the Salvation Army, and he asked her the same question. So you're sinless? You don't sin? Same typical question. Well, I don't sin on purpose. I still make mistakes, but still, you know. Oh, so your failed obedience to the law is helping save you? Like, it, they they just go in the same circles, and they, and they won't hear it. They will not hear it. Those people you can't help. What I do is I pray for them. I pray for them and I pray that the law makes them so guilty. I pray that they start seeing how they're failing God every time they gossip or overeat or watch TV too long. I pray that they get broken under the weight of how much they still fail God so that they come and realize their need for his grace. That's what I do. I pray for them. Well, uh, obviously, it's true. There are people who are sincere when they ask questions. I mean, after all, look at all of us. We're all believers, and at one point we were not believers, but we were willing to listen. So obviously there are people that, uh, uh, yes, well, let's be patient with them, but let's not be stupid and, and, and waste our time on people. We should be able to recognize if someone is just messing with us and just wasting our time uh, it's much easier to do it in person. I know that texting, it's hard to understand the motive behind it. But in, in person, uh, you can you can understand a lot more about their what their really uh, intentions are. Uh, but so, yeah, obviously there's people that uh, we're going to be patient. And uh, I think I mentioned this on Friday, but uh, a few years ago, um, my wife and I are at a dinner party, uh, friends of my wife, and they're these couple are 20 years older than us. And uh, they asked me, well, what have you been up to? Uh, you, you still play a lot of golf? And I said, well, a little bit of golf. Mostly I'm working on my Christian ministry work. And they weren't familiar with it, but they got curious. And they said, well, whoa, oh, that's interesting. What, tell me about it. And and they were, they told me that they were believers, professing Christians. And they uh, attended church regularly, and and, uh, uh, and yet, as we talked, I realized that they didn't really even know what the gospel was, so I gave them the gospel. They were amazed. I could, uh, can you imagine someone that's, let's say, at that time, they must have been 80 years old, in church their whole life, and when they heard the gospel, they were shocked. That's why I, ca I call it the shocking good news. When, when most people have never heard the real gospel, and when they hear it, they say, "Are you serious? That's in the Bible." I hear that all the time from people. Are you? That's in the Bible? And then you show them the verses, and they say, they're amazed. They never knew that was in the Bible. That salvation's a gift. You don't earn it. You just receive it through faith. So when they when they realize that, they're amazed. But they when they believe that they're just happy as could be. And that's what happened with them at this late age in their life. They learned the gospel and they believed. And I could tell from their countenance, they were just so happy to, to learn the real gospel and believe it. And no, because they're getting very close to the end. Matter of fact, last week, Lila just died. And we have the funeral this Saturday coming up. And her husband Boyce is, 
survivor, but th that night they learned the gospel. I believe they believed the gospel. Uh, so um, there, there are people, though, that actually are interested and they want to hear it. And with those people, I'm going to be as loving and patient as anybody here. Nobody will be more patient than me. But to the lordship heretic that is, is, is swine, as soon as I determine when there's swine, you're, going to, you're dealing with a different person then. I'm not going to put up with that kind of stupidity. And they're going to know that you are full of spiritual pride and self-righteousness, and it's sickening to me and the Lord. He's sick. He hates your self-righteousness. They just want to accuse. They want to accuse, and they want to, yeah, they, I, I've, I've made the mistake of going on programs with them to where I'm either forced to yell over them or just sit there so that they look like they're preaching right. You know, it's just they, they do it to trap you and accuse. And it's it's an ugly, ugly spirit. And uh, it's horrible. But how great is it, Brother Luke, when you hear things like, wow, that's in the Bible. I love it when people are like, really? God said. I mean, they had heard Jesus died for sins. Everybody heard that, but they didn't really realize what was accomplished and that eternal life really was a free gift by, by faith in what he did on Calvary. Like they thought that was just part of it. It was Jesus did this, but mainly it's about following him as your teacher and living the Christian life and self-sacrifice and that kind of stuff. And eventually if you're good enough, you get to have it. And so they... I love it when people hear it and really like they're excited about that. And I pray that people believe. So all we can do is go out there, like you said, plant as many seeds as possible. That's what we do when we go out here on the internet. We pray that people have ears to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just, I just looked at the time. I can't believe this, man. We're all, we're about 15, 20 minutes behind schedule here. I'm, uh, I, I thought uh, I had no idea. Um, okay, I guess that means we, we can't have any more questions. I did I did copy a question though from uh, Ben. Did you would you, you get this and save it? Here, I put it here in our private chat space. It's a question by uh, uh, Mark Corbett. Save, yes, I got it. Save Mark Corbett's question and, and put that on our list. Yep. Uh, but I guess we can't get into any more questions today. Uh, let's let's take the time now to uh, give a gospel message and uh, and give our closing remarks here. Um, who should give that gospel message? I wonder. You should. Hmm. Or the exhortation. <laughs> uh, no, let's let's have Renee give the gospel message. And you give you give an exhortation, Ben. I'm sure you can think of some kind words to say. Okay, I did last week. I'll have to come up with something new this week. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that you're going to be able to do it. Uh, all right, then. Um, let's start off with uh, Sister Renee. Uh, give us your summary of the talk today, and, and then and give them the good news, the the, the, the shocking good news. My favorite. Uh, questions are those about scriptures and how they're taken wrong. I, I love doing that because it forces me to study on the spot and uh, I love it. So thank you for sending the questions in. I, I also know that uh, you send in questions that aren't from you because you already know the answer, but are from people that oppose the truth. And it's good. We address these things, you know, like what about the free will? You can, give it back or, you know, God is not respecting your free will if he won't let you go to hell once you're saved or something. So it's, it's important that we address these things because these are common arguments against our blessed assurance in Christ. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, the gospel message, I, I like to do it a little different every time. I, I'm going to go over this uh, in the frame of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when someone uh, uh, every year they would have to do animal sacrifices to pay for the sin of the nation. And each individual would have to bring a lamb. And we know that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So with that in mind, think about Israel, who every year continually, as Hebrew says, 
they would have to bring a lamb to the high priest and he would lay hands. That's what it means about the let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. One of those dead works is the laying on of hands. And what he means by that is the laying on of hands to the animal to impute our sin upon the animal, right? So that when the animal is sacrificed, our sin is laid on the animal and his blood pays for the sin. All right. It's as if we're making the lamb guilty for what we did, even though he's innocent. Now, Hebrews also tells us the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But what it did do is it atoned for it. It would temporarily cover the sin of the nation and the individuals of the nation so that God could have a continuing relationship with them. So that's how the law worked with blood sacrifice. Every year they'd have to offer it over and over again. So there was always a remembrance of sin every year continually. They were reminded they had to pay for it. Then the next year the blood had to pay for it. So there was a constant reminder of sin. However, we're told in Hebrews that uh, although the priest used to make those sacrifices year by year continually, they could never make the comers thereunto perfect. Okay, because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But Jesus, he died once for all. Now, if you do a study of the Passover lamb and what Jesus went through, you'll find that he was inspected to have no spot or blemish, just like the lambs were inspected for X amount of days before they were sacrificed. The same thing happened. He was inspected by the high priest. He was uh, accused of sin, but they couldn't find any sin, right? So he was found to be without spot or blemish. Our lamb is without spot or blemish. And so when Jesus died, he was the lamb of God. He was the sacrifice for all of us. And so when the high priest would receive the lamb on behalf of a sinner under the Old Testament, the sinner was not inspected by the high priest. The high priest didn't come up to him and say, let me look behind your ear to see if you got any spots. Let me look. The sinner was not inspected because the sinner was not clean, was not perfect. That's why he needed a lamb. Okay. It's the same thing here. Jesus is our lamb. He's the lamb of God. He died one time for all. He takes away, purged all of our sins, the sins of the whole world. That's how precious his blood was. But God is not inspecting us. He's not saying, let me look at you, Renee, if you've got spot, if you've got sin. He already knows I have it. I have sinful flesh. That's why Jesus had to die for me. So see, we don't enter heaven because God looks at us and says, okay, I'm going to inspect Renee if she's without sin. I am without sin if I'm under the blood of Jesus, though, because he stands in my place and gives me his righteousness. Why? Because my lamb was found to be worthy and without spot or blemish. So it's acceptable to God as a sacrifice on my behalf. So the gospel message is the thin debt you owed, the wages of sin is death was paid for by Jesus because he died. And so the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because he paid my sin debt, your sin debt in his own blood as the lamb of God. Now, because his blood was so precious and he only died once for all, he does not have to keep being sacrificed. So we should have no more consciousness of sin in the sense that it's being held against us on judgment day. The blood of Jesus purged our sins forever. Gone. God knows the end from the beginning. His blood covers the sin of the past, present, future because he died once for all. He's not going to die again next year to cover those sins that I commit next year. Okay. And we all still sin. I don't care what these people say. 
We're not trying to sin more. It's just we do. The Bible talks about sin done in ignorance. We, we don't even know sometimes, but we're still in sinful flesh. And so his blood covers our sin, purges it, pays for it because our lamb is worthy. He is without spot or blemish, not because you are. You see, most people think their merit is what's going to allow them interest into heaven. That God is going to look at them and say, yep, they were good enough. They lived the good life. They can come on in. That's not going to happen. He's going to look at your sacrifice. How worthy was your lamb? And if you don't have Jesus, you won't be worthy. You can't enter. It's as simple as that. That's why Jesus is the only way. He's the only one that was sinless, that laid his life down and paid for us in his own blood. There is no other way but Jesus. And if you try to come up another way, you're a thief and a liar. That's what the Bible says. And so the good news is your lamb was worthy. He was without spot or blemish and he paid your sin debt and he made you perfect and he made you righteous and you were justified, declared righteous in the sight of God. You've been reconciled to God because your lamb died once for all and paid the entirety of your sin debt. That's why when you see God on judgment day, you will owe no debt to him because Jesus paid it in his own blood. Okay. Amen. Thank you, sister. All right. Uh, Brother Ben, can, were you able to think of some encouraging words? Yes, uh, but they're, they are few. Um, so this, uh, All right. So, All right. But it, it is simple, but uh, this is something I've, uh, I've observed is that um, I believe once we're saved, uh, God does put a, 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 a love, uh, a desire to love on one another as brothers and sisters. And so not only are we exhorted to love one another? I think God gives the ability to do that. Um, and I, I know that's certainly true for me. And But yet what I find is that uh, it, there, there are sometimes lack of love among Christians. But a lot of times it's it's not so much that, that the love is not being um, uh, exercised, but it's not being received. A lot of people do not receive the love from other Christians. They're, they're suspicious or they they're, they do don't know what's why why that this person is you know taking an interest in them an interest in terms of you know understanding who they are uh, what their problems are or how they might be able to help them um, so I, again I would just encourage everyone to not only um, uh, give love but but don't be afraid to receive it either um, because again I, I see uh, it's it's a twofold uh, it's two sided and um, often it's often it's um, there's a general lack of love in general, but then when there is, sometimes it's not received. And that that uh, not only hurts the person who's trying to give it, but also the person who would receive it, they're not receiving uh, essentially the love of God uh, from another believer. So that would be my exhortation this week is just uh, let's look let's look out for one another, see how we can serve one another, uh, and let's be about, be about that business. So, mm -hmm. Amen. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard, though, to, to love others. Um, I'm sorry, I have to confess that. It's, uh, for the most part, it's easy when uh, when uh, people are loving back. But the challenge is, as Jesus said, you know, loving your enemy is... Uh, it's easy to love those who love you, but to love your enemy, that's thats what we're called to do. That's very hard. Lord, help me, please. All right. Um, time flew by. It's been That's been the case, though, lately. It seems like every program, I look at the clock, and I say, I can't believe how fast the time flew by. Today, I started off not feeling right. Uh I, did, I don't think I was thinking clearly, and I was feeling a little on edge and agitated. I think it's a, a, a physical thing. I just, my my um, nerves and body was uh, off a little. It affected me, but uh, by the by the end of the program, I felt the love and the, the, uh, the passion 
uh, for for Christ and for the the congregation. So thankful, very thankful for that. All right, this is Sunday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday is a few days away. Join us on this same channel, nine thirty Eastern time, for the Wednesday night Bible study. And I know that I've uh, I sometimes like a nagging. Uh, what did uh, Solomon say? It's better to live in a in in, in your, alone in your attic than into a, in a mansion with a nagging wife. Well, I guess he had some nagging wives, but I, no one likes to be nagged at, and I, I I think that maybe I come off like I'm nagging. And I really don't want to do that, but it is frustrating to me to see uh, so often that uh, the basic rules of the the congregation how we we've all agreed that these are the way that we'll conduct ourselves during these church programs and yet it seemed like so many of us are totally unaware of the rules and the protocol so i'm going to ask everybody would you all take the time to actually just read the the chat room protocols it's only probably about 15 sentences it, it wouldn't take but two minutes or three minutes to read it just read it, so at least you, you're aware of uh, how we are. Uh, we expect uh, the conduct to be uh, while church is going on, and we do consider Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday programs to be church. Okay, please do that. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.